The wait is over, people. Sound the alarms. The eighth generation of Pokemon is here. Two months ago. Look, look, I know, I'm a little late to the hype train, but have no fear, because it's finally time for me to play Pokemon Sword, and more specifically, Pokemon Shield. Man, it feels good to be back in the wonderful world of Pokemon, so let's not dilly-dally any further. You know the drill at this point. Welcome to the first rebranded episode of the Chip Tide Show. Richard, hit that intro. If you take a look at the vast majority of the videos on my channel, the more astute of you may realize that I freaking love Pokemon. I've been playing it for over a decade. I've played every game more times than I can remember. I've done Nuzlocks, randomizers, created my own challenge runs, you name it, I've done it. It's easily my favorite game franchise, no, 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 you know what, easily my favorite franchise full stop. And it's not even that close. So yeah, I think it's safe to say that I was pretty freaking excited for these games. But this episode actually presented me with a bit of a dilemma. For you see, I was originally going to talk about my first playthrough, give my thoughts and do a bit of a review like I usually do, but the problem is that I didn't record any gameplay from my first playthrough. Now, I could have always just recorded some random post-game footage or something and just throw it in the background while I talk about stuff that has nothing to do with what you're seeing on screen, but I didn't want to do that. So the way I saw it, there was only one solution. I had to play the game again. I was originally just going to go through with a regular playthrough with some new mons that I hadn't used yet, but then I had an idea. A brilliantly stupid idea. What if I played through the entire game with just Squovit. And that's exactly what I did. But let's take a few steps back. On the off chance that some of you aren't familiar with Pokemon, each new generation always comes with a little normal type that you can find super early on in the game that's usually not that great, evolves pretty early, and is pretty much only there for the early game trainers to throw at you. You know, your Rattatas, your Bidoofs, those guys. It's quite an elite group, to say the least, and the newest addition to the gang with Sword and Shield is Little Squovit here. People hardly ever use these guys any longer than like the first gym, because like I said, they're pretty bad. But I'd like to think that I'm pretty good at Pokemon at this point, so Squovit only for the whole game? How hard could it be? So I feel like before we get into it, I just want to say that this episode of the Chip Tide Show will have a bit of a different format than the rest. For most of them, I talk about the game, throw in some jokes, and do a bit of a review before calling it a day. But this episode, I'm skipping all that. You want my review? I think these games are great. There you go. Instead, today, I'd like to sit down and tell you a story. A story of a boy and a squirrel. Alone versus the whole world on a journey to be the very best like no one ever was. I'm going to assume that everyone has played this game before, so I'm going to skip over all the beginning rigmarole and stuff. If you haven't yet, don't worry, it's not really important for this episode. It's basically just introducing you to all the characters and stuff, so I'll breeze through it real quick. You're a silent kid who lives in a small town. You have a friend named Hop who's got way too much energy all the time. Hop's got an older brother named Leon who has exactly two character traits. He's the unbeatable champion and he gets lost all the time. I swear, 
anytime anybody talks about him, it's either, oh, I hope he doesn't get lost, or wow, that guy's the greatest trainer in the world. There is literally not a single person who can beat him or his Charizard. Oh, really? I am going to kill your dragon with a squirrel. Also, just a little pet peeve about him, he keeps using the word champion as an adjective. Dude, I get it, you're the champ, but that's not how that word works. Having a champion time isn't a thing, you can't just say whatever you want with the word champion, that's not how grammar works. But I digress, Leon somehow manages to find his way back to his own home and gives you your first Pokemon. Just for the heck of it, I chose Sobble because look how precious this boy is. I named him Ted, and I was off. Before you get your Pokeballs, you gotta venture into the forest, and you get lost in the fog. Ooh, spooky Mirage Pokemon that's totally not on the box. Leon somehow manages to find you. Guess he's not that bad with directions after all. You visit the professor and her granddaughter, Sonia. You get a Pokedex, and boom! You got your Pokeballs. Now it's time for the fun to really begin. So I ran onto Route 1, and caught the first Squobit that I saw. Now, I could have tried to get a bunch to get better natures or whatever, but fate brought me and this Squobit together, so I'm sticking with it. Everybody, allow me to introduce Bobby. Now, just a humble squirrel, soon a legend. Ted, it's been real, but from here on out, it's me and Bobby versus the world. So I set out battling some wild Pokemon to get some levels and stuff, and all was going pretty well. Before I knew it, I was at the professor's house, and it was already time for the first proper rival battle. And it was here that I realized, this might not have been such a great idea. Because you see, there were some problems that I didn't consider before hopping into this. Pun definitely intended. For starters, Hop likes to use Growl. Like... A lot. In fact, every early game trainer loves Growl. Well, what can I say? It's hot these days. Now, that may not seem like such a big deal. It's not like Growl is some super strong attack or anything. All it does is lower your attack by one stage. Just switch out and reset it. Ah, oh, right. When you only have one Pokemon with you, if your stat gets lowered turn one, that's too bad. You're stuck with it. Squovit is decently bulky at this level, but it's pretty freaking slow. So I basically just had to sit there and chip away at Hop's three Pokemon little by little. Did it take a while? Oh yeah. But Bobby isn't to be stopped so easily. Through growls, through burns, through all three Pokemon, Bobby prevailed. I think this is a bright sign of things to come. There are a couple of good things about doing a solo run that I discovered as well. For starters, when all the experience from every single battle you get is poured into one little squirrel, you get pretty buff pretty quick. Second, anytime you find a Pokeball or a Revive or something like that, that's just free money right there. So, of course, I did what any responsible person would do when they came into a large sum of money. Immediately spent it all on an expensive t-shirt. I have no regrets. But aside from that, the early game isn't that exciting, so I'm going to skip ahead a bit to the wild area. That's right, ever since Breath of the Wild, no game is safe from the open world treatment. But look, if you saw my Breath of the Wild episode, you'll know that I'm not a huge fan of open world stuff, so it should be no surprise that I'm not totally jazzed about the wild area. Luckily, you don't have to do anything here. So I think I'm just going to run through, maybe battle a few- Oh. Oh shoot. So yeah, it turns out that Bobby isn't fast enough to run away from anything here, and these guys are actually pretty tough. I almost immediately got bodied by a Mudbray with Rock Smash, and then literally one battle later, a Growlithe with Ember. <sighs> Looks like I'm going to have to stay here a bit longer than I thought. But, luckily, I have a trick up my sleeve in the form of Max Raid Battles. Funnily enough, these huge battles are actually easier than a lot of the wild Pokemon. So after laying the smack down on this Bunnelby here, I managed to get five levels off the candy from it. 
that looks good enough to me, so I'm off to Motostoke. And again, there's a lot of plot-based stuff here that I'm going to breeze through. Motostoke is a massive city. I changed some of my clothes, went up the most unsafe elevator in the world. Oh, hey, look, it's Team Yell. Sick opening ceremonies cutscene. And finally, we are off to the races. So, our first destination is Turfield, home to the first gym. So, I battled all the trainers on Route 3 and decided to take a quick break to do some Pokemon Camp. Pokemon Camp. I also tried my hand at cooking with... questionable results. It was really bad. Luckily, Becca here actually knew what she was doing and we managed to make something alright. Shoutouts to Becca. After that, it was into the Galar Mines, which, uh... Well, it was pretty freaking annoying, to say the least. It was not fun. Rock Pokemon resist all my normal type moves and have a naturally high defense. Yeah, them rocks. Meaning that I had to whittle them down with bite and fighting Pokemon can hit Bobby for huge, huge damage. But it was there that I discovered a secret weapon. A trap card, if you will. And that, my friends, is Spit Up. Spit Up. First, you have to use the move Stockpile, Gotta pile those stocks. which raises your defenses by one stage. You can use it up to three times before clicking Spit Up, which resets your defenses and damages your opponent. What I didn't realize, however, is that Spit Up shreds. Yeah, like some mozzarella. Even with just one Stockpile up, this thing does damage. And if Poppy gets to three, that's game over. GG, mate. On top of that, setting up stockpiles is super easy because Bobby gets buffer and buffer. Oh yeah, getting swole. And what's better, it's a special attack, so growl all you want. <sighs> this actually ended up being our signature move, which is hilarious because it's basically just Bobby throwing up on everyone. Oh yeah, vomit. There's a battle with the absolute scumbag that is your rival, Bead. At least I think that's how it's pronounced. But he's got all psychic types, so all Bobby had to do was click bite and laugh. But the road to Turfield is way longer than I thought, and it turns out there's another route between the cave and the town. One more to go. But it was on this route that Bobby learned Body Slam over Tackle, which is... It was super strong. After that, we finally made it to Turfield. But before heading into the first gym, I ran over here and grabbed an Everstone. Yes, Everstone, the item that keeps your Pokemon from evolving. What, you thought I was planning on evolving, Bobby? Nah, when I say Squovit solo run, I mean Squovit solo run. Greet it, take a hike. Now, I can always just press B to keep it from evolving and give it a useful item, but that's annoying and I didn't want it. So Everstone it is. But now it's finally time for the first gym. And I'll be honest, it was a little anticlimactic. Milo here only has two Pokemon, the first of which got wrecked pretty quickly. And the Dynamax Eldegoss gave me a bit more trouble and Bobby got down to three at one point, but in the end, it fell to the mighty spit up like all the rest. With the first badge in our pockets, it was time for number two. Thankfully, the road between the first and second gym is super short, and by this point, Bobby and I had really hit our stride, so there wasn't anything that could slow us down. Except for this Sableye that kept disabling Bite, so I couldn't hit it with any of my normal moves. That kind of sucked. But before I knew it, we had made it to Holbury, and it was time to battle Nessa. And again, not that big of a problem. She leads with a Goldeen, the definitive dumbest Pokemon, so I took the opportunity to set up some stockpiles, and that's the game. I was a little worried about her Dreadnaw, seeing as it has really high defense and resisted Body Slam, but then I remembered that Max Darkness lowers special defense. So, 
after Dynamax, it was game over. Unfortunately, I was having some problems with my recording device, so the next leg of the game didn't record properly, but honestly, you didn't miss much. We went through the most creatively named place in the game, Gallermine number 2, which played out basically exactly the same as last time. There was another bead battle, if you can even call it a battle, and later we battled another rival, Marnie. She's actually a little bit tougher because she has two fighting types, but after a few stockpiles, Bobby was able to handle it just fine. And once her ace, Moropeko, came out, all you gotta do is click spit up and seal the deal. With all that out of the way, it was time for the third gym leader, Kabu. Now, this was the first gym leader that I was really worried about because he's actually pretty tough. But before we can even think about fighting him, we have to get through the gym challenge. Now, I didn't talk about the other two because, quite frankly, there's nothing challenging about hurting Wulu or solving puzzles. But Kabu's challenge is different. In case you forgot, what you're supposed to do is catch some Pokemon in the gym while the gym trainers try to kill it first. But I wasn't about to go and catch some Pokemon just because some old man wants me to. Not after coming this far. Luckily, you can still get points for KOing the Pokemon, you just have to do more of them. Unfortunately, fighting these guys is really freaking annoying because the other gym trainers will do everything in their power to KO the wild Pokemon, or you for that matter, first. It took me way longer than I'd like to admit to get through this, but eventually Bobby pulled through. With all that crap behind us, it was finally time for Bobby and I to take down Kabu. He led with a Ninetales that immediately used Will-O-Wisp to cripple my attack. Annoying, but no matter, no matter. We always have our signature spit up. Get three stockpiles up and... Alright, so maybe Kabu was a little bit tougher than I thought. So I guess it's back to the wild area for me and Bobby to power level a bit. After a few more max raid battles, Bobby was well and juiced up, so it was time for round two. It started out basically the same way, except now I was able to take attacks much better. But after some lucky dodges and a paralysis on Body Slam, I was able to heal my burn and KO the Ninetales with three stockpiles still intact. Arcanine went down pretty much the same way, except Bobby was looking pretty low on health with a burn going into Scorch. But do you think something as trivial as a burn could stop Bobby? Uh, yeah, it just did, like a minute ago. But not this time! All I gotta do is play it smart, stall out the Gigantamax turns, and BAM! Sure, it did live a spit up, but Kabu was an absolute fool and didn't capitalize on it, and the fire badge was ours! After that, it's back to the wild area where I got a few more levels, but didn't overstay my welcome and pretty much beelined it for Hammerlock. Some more story stuff that we're going to skip over. Bede committed murder on Hop's morale. We had to visit some boring vault. And then it's off to Route 6. Not a whole lot to say here, except that I found a TM for Dig. I didn't teach it to Bobby yet, but remember it because it'll come into play later on. I also got wrecked by some random trainer with a throw, but luckily I was able to avoid them on the second time through and made it to Stow on side, which, side note, is a really dumb name for a town. There's not much to do in Stow on side before the gym, so I figured there's no time like the present. Now this gym is interesting because it's ghost type. That means that Bobby can't be hit by any of their spectral stab moves, but they also can't get hit by ours either. Yes, even the mighty spit up, but I wasn't worried. Bobby was buff as hell by this point, and was still rocking that bite, so I thought we could just stroll in, bite everything in sight, and be on our merry way. Oh ho ho, how naive I was. Little did I know that I was about to enter the Nightmare of Alistair. So I waltzed into the gym like I owned the place and took down all the little gym minions in this weird pinball machine thing. I didn't teach Bobby any new moves because well, quite frankly, I forgot, but even though Bite was the only move I had that could do damage to these guys, 
I wasn't worried. All the chumps in the beginning were no trouble, but I was running a little low on PP for bite, so I decided to teach Bobby Dig from the TM I picked up earlier. After that, it was off to the pitch to meet the masked monster himself. I went in guns blazing, but Alistair took one look at my half PP biting Bobby, laughed, and slapped me for my hubris. For you see, his ghost types had a few tricks up their sleeves that didn't make this battle difficult, but nearly impossible. He led with a Galarian Yamask, yeah who, quite honestly, isn't that bad. Its only damaging move that can affect Bobby is Brutal Swing, which isn't all that threatening. It also had Disable to lock out Bite for a few turns, but good thing I taught it Dig, so it wasn't that big of an issue. So I took out the Yamask yeah feeling good, but what I didn't realize was that it was all part of his master plan. Lure me into a false sense of security with an easy lead, then twist the knife. And he did just that with his second Pokemon, Mimikyu, who used a tried and true tactic, lowering Bobby's attack. Not only does it have baby doll eyes, it freaking spams it. Normally, this wouldn't be an issue. Just use a couple of special spit-ups and that's the game. But here in the realm of the dead, that's not an option. So I was forced to sit there, slowly chipping away at it with bite and dig, and it got to slash away to its heart's content. Bobby eventually came out on top, but at the cost of most of his PP and nearly every potion I had. And if you thought I was out of the woods already, oh, oh, oh no, my friend. This nightmare, it's only just getting started. For his next Pokemon is the fearsome, the mighty, the terrifying, the never before seen Cursula. And if you couldn't tell by the name, this monstrosity has a signature move of sorts. One that sends shivers down the spines of anyone attempting a solo run. Curse. When used by a ghost type, the user loses half of their own HP, but in exchange, young Bobby will lose 25% of his health. Every turn. Normally, you can get rid of Curse by switching out, but Bobby... Bobby stands alone. So every turn... For the entire battle, I had to deal with a huge HP loss. Losing half your own health seems like a lot, but when Bobby's attack stat is already through the floor, it's a small price to pay for eternal torment. But I had a plan, a way to overcome the fate that we had been cursed with and still walk away with a badge. Normally I wait for the last Pokemon to Dynamax Bobby, but this time I decided to do it early. The Cursula was already at half, so I thought I could take it down with one big hit before it could do any more damage than it already had and still have two turns left to KO his ace. I thought it was a good plan. I was wrong. The Cursula lived on one magic pixel and was able to get another hit off. I had to wait for the next turn to take it out, meaning I only had one turn left of Dynamax to take out his final Pokemon, Gengar. But I still wasn't worried. One turn was more than enough, especially with a super effective ground type max move on my side. But the baby doll eyes proved to be too much. Bobby lived one attack from the Gengar, but the max quake didn't even do a half. My hopes now dashed. I let the curse take Bobby, and faded to black. Now I hear you. Chips, how can you and Bobby possibly hope to defeat such an oppressive foe? Is this where the journey comes to an end? And to that I say, oh ye of so little faith, the journey is never over. Bobby will never be stopped. As for how I can defeat the Nightmare of Alistair, for this second round, I had a little trick up my sleeve, a move that Bobby had tried to learn earlier, but I had passed on until now. And that, my friends, is Bullet Seed. A grass type move that doesn't deal much damage on its own, but can hit two to five times at once. Super effective against the Yamask in case Bite is disabled. Able to break the Mimikyu's disguise and continue to deal damage in the same turn. And Cursula, 
Ho 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 ho! You might not know, but Cursula has the ability Weak Armor, which lowers its defense and raises its speed every time it's hit with a physical move. Bullet Seed is a physical move, meaning it has the capability to lower its defense five stages in a single turn. That means that with luck, Bobby could potentially finish it off in a single hit. With this new strategy, Bobby would surely be unstoppable. The battle started out just as I had planned. The mask was no problem and the Mimikyu didn't fare much better. Though it did still manage to get a few baby doll eyes off. But it was now time to test my hunch. The Cursula hit the field. I clicked bullet seed and crossed my fingers. With a bit of luck, I could blow past this thing. But I quickly learned that in the nightmare, luck is never on your side. The first bullet seed only hit two times and Cursula immediately got a curse off. After spending a turn healing, I was able to take it down with a bite, but the damage was already done. Gengar was able to come out and once again have its way with Bobby. And for the second time, Alistair was victorious. Now I was starting to sweat, because you see, I was quickly encountering a problem that I had not foreseen. Time. The deadline for this episode was rapidly approaching and me and Bobby weren't even halfway done. I considered just postponing the video and doing a different game instead, but it was too late for that. I was committed and I didn't have time to waste on old Alistair here. So was this the end of the journey? Were the naysayers right? Is it impossible to defeat the Gala region with a mere squirrel? No. No! Bobby can never be stopped. Not by some kid in a mask. Not by a piece of dead coral. Not by the flow of time itself. Alistair may be tough, but he's not immortal. So, it was time to go back to our tried and true strategy. It was time to go back to the wild area. There, we trained together, harder than we had ever trained before. We slayed giant after giant, ate candy after candy. We became stronger than any Squovit had ever become before. Yeah, so I may have overdone it a bit. But now that our training montage was complete, it was time to have our revenge. We walked back into the stadium, more confident than we had ever been. We looked that nightmare right in his mask holes and saw not a fearless monster, but a mere mortal boy. He sent out your mask. Bobby slayed it. He sent out Mimikyu. Bobby slayed it. He sent out the dreaded Cursula. It managed to survive the first bullet seed, but in his fear, Alistair misplayed. He missed the opportunity to lay down a curse and used a feeble ancient power instead. Bobby sensed this weakness like a shark smelling blood in the water and slayed it. All that was left was the Gengar, the embodiment of the nightmare itself. Both Bobby and Gengar turned giant. Gengar tried to attack, but Bobby had grown to a power beyond what anyone had seen before. He unleashed a mighty Max Quake and slayed the Gengar. Finally, the nightmare was over. This little squovet had prevailed, and the dream of Bobby had begun. As you can probably tell, this episode is nearing its conclusion. But fear not, for the tale of Bobby does not end here. So yeah, apparently Bobby can't stop the flow of time. Yet. So here's what we're going to do. In the description is a poll where you can vote on what we do next. I can either continue the story in a future episode of the Chip Tide Show, or I can do it as a live series over the summer, Let's Play style. The choice is yours. I could honestly go either way. But that just about brings this episode of the Chip Tide Show to a close. If you enjoyed it or have any suggestions on how to make it better, make sure to let me know in the comments down below. This is the first episode with our new 3D style, so let me know what you think about it because I'm always looking to improve it. 
If you want to see more from the show, there's a playlist probably on screen in the description below, so you can go check that out. And if you want to be the first to know when new episodes come out, you can subscribe and follow me on Twitter, at the Chip Tide. New episodes come out every three weeks, Thursdays at 2 o'clock p.m. EST, so I will see you then. But until then, don't forget to take it easy. Also, Richard sucks. I feel like I haven't mentioned him enough this episode, so I'll put it here. <laughs>